Hello, I'm Fráinne Hambly and I'm delighted you can join me today at my home in County Mayo for this workshop, Bunting's Harp Journey. This is brought to you through Harp Ireland, or Crick Erin. They've also been doing a fantastic series of performances, Harps for Hope. And if you haven't already checked out some of those um, videos, you should do that because it's just some fantastic music out there. So in this workshop, we'll be talking about the Belfast Harp Festival of 1792, Edward Bunting, who is the man who wrote down the music of the harpers at that festival and subsequently published three collections, um, The Ancient Music of Ireland. So we'll be talking about the importance of those collections and how we can access those collections to add some of those tunes into our own repertoire today and how it's relevant for us in the present day. Um, before I talk too much, I would like to play a tune from the collection for you, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about and if you haven't heard of bunting or the harp festival or anything like that don't worry i'll give you lots more information as we go along but first i'll just play a tune it was published in 1840 in bunting's final volume of his three collections it was collected in 1792 from dennis hempson who was the last harp player to play the early irish harp in the old style with long fingernails on wire strings and it's called soft mild morning or Majin bog even so this is, I suppose, a modern interpretation of a tune from the Bunton Collection. <laughs> for the harping tradition when the, the Irish harping was inscribed on the UNESCO Register of Intangible Cultural Heritage. So that was fantastic recognition. The harp dates back. There are stories of the magical instrument in Irish mythology, which of course we can't put an exact date on that. But the first definite depictions of the harp come from the 9th century when it appears in illustrated manuscripts and also on the stone crosses or the high crosses. From then on, we had in the 12th century descriptions of the harp music by a man called Geraldus Cambrensis. He wrote a lot about Ireland and mostly he didn't have anything very good to say apart from about the harp and the skill of the harpers. He describes the sound of the early Irish harp very well. Um, and this would have come from the era of, I suppose, the bardic tradition when you had poets, reciters and harpers who were the three groups of people who made up the order, the bardic order. And each Irish chieftain had their own harpers and poets. They pro provided a really important function in society, not just entertainment. They were skilled professional musicians, highly trained and very kind of valued members of society. This, I suppose you could say, was like the golden era of harping up to around 1600. The Trinity College harp, which you might have seen if you've ever visited Dublin, um, it's there it's near the Book of Kells exhibit in Trinity College. And it's also the harp that's the image on our coins and all our official documents um, dates from that period as well. Now, in 1607, there was an event in Irish history known as Flight of the Earls. 
And that was an event where many of the Irish chieftains, following repeated defeats at the hands of the English, they left Ireland and went to continental Europe. And they either brought their harpers with them or those who remained behind, the harpers kind of found themselves in a new world where they had to make their living basically traveling around Ireland. And this was the era, I suppose you could say, of the wandering harpers. Turlico Carolyn is by far the most famous. And another one of the workshops in this series is all about Carolyn. This is actually the 350th anniversary of his birth this year. So I won't say too much about him because you can tune in for an entire workshop just about him. But he's our most famous harp player and he was born in 1670, as I mentioned. So I suppose from Carolyn on up to the end of the 18th century, the harp went into decline. It had been very, very popular, but then once the pianoforte was invented and for various other reasons, which we don't know, I suppose changing tastes in music maybe and different factors, the harp tradition went into decline. And at the time of the Belfast Harp Festival in 1792, it was on the verge of dying out. So this is why the festival was so, so significant because really it preserved a lot of that harp music that might have been lost. Now, you might be wondering why people were so concerned with preserving the Irish harp tradition. And it wasn't necessarily that they thought it was a beautiful instrument or beautiful music, although I'm sure they probably did as well, but it was very much linked with the fact that the harp was seen as a symbol of Irish identity by the Anglo-Irish. And they also, they saw the harp tradition as a last link with the sort of past golden age in Ireland. And it was also very much tied up with the political situation in the 18th century. Now, I could go into a whole, you could do a few different workshops on just that kind of historical context alone, but I won't go into too much detail. But basically, people realised that the harp tradition was in danger of dying out and they wanted to capture some of this music before that happened. Now, the first attempts to preserve the tradition were in the 1780s, um, when three festivals were held in Granard in County Longford but they were just run as competitions and they didn't really have any lasting impact. However, the really important event for us was in 1792, Dr. James MacDonald organised the Belfast Harp Festival, or it's also known as the Belfast Harpers Assembly. And he had the really kind of very inspired idea that not just to invite the harpers to come and perform, not just to have a competition, but to have somebody come and write down their music. And that man was Edward Bunting. Now, Bunting was born in 1773 in Armagh, and he must have been kind of quite, a, I suppose, a musical genius as a child because at 11 years of age, he was a, became apprentice organist in St. Anne's Church in Belfast, and he moved to Belfast, so that's where he would have met Dr. James MacDonald. And he was 19 years old at the time of the festival. So Bunting was invited to come for three days, and the harpers came and played their music and Bunting wrote down their music. Now, 10 harpers performed. Actually, there were 11 at the festival, but one of them was from Wales. And because the main kind of thinking behind the festival was preserving this link to the sort of glorious Irish past, we don't really know very much about what he played or anything else about him because it wasn't part of their kind of brief, I suppose you could say. But the 10 harpers who did play, one was a 15 year old boy one was Dennis Hempson, who I mentioned earlier. He was in his 90s and he was the last person playing with the long fingernails on the wire strings. Um, just briefly, when I was talking about the bards and the Trinity College harp, I should have mentioned the instruments that were played at this time were very, very different to the harp that I'm playing here. These were the early Irish harps strung with metal strings, no levers. These levers are for changing the semitones. They didn't have any of those. The harp players used long fingernails and they also played the harp on their left shoulder. So it was a very different sound and also a very different style of playing to what we have nowadays. But by 1792, the only person still playing in that very ancient style was Dennis Hempson. So he, and then all the rest of the harp players who were mostly in their middle, in their 40s or 50s, they also came and played. And there was one woman at the festival. Now, Edward Bunting came to the festival. I, I can just imagine what he faced because the thought of being asked to write down performance after performance over the course of three days for anybody would be very difficult. But he was coming from a classical art music background and the harp players were obviously coming from a completely different background. 
So he was really thrown in at the deep end, you could say. And you can see from his notebooks, which are all housed at Queen's University Belfast, they have the manuscript collection um, from, from Bunting's life, um, that the first thing he did was just write down the dots to get the pitches. And then you can see where he wrote it in again with the kind of showing the rhythms after that. And eventually then before publication, he had the kind of the final version where he arranged the tunes. So he wrote down the music at the festival, but then he really became so absorbed in the harp tradition that he sort of, well, he not only published three volumes of, of music based on that, but he also traveled to Connacht and Mayo and various parts of the country collecting music, not just from harp players, but from fiddlers, singers, pipers, anybody really. Um, he, when he undertook these travels, a man also traveled with him, Patrick Lynch. Now, this was another slight problem for Bunting because Bunting didn't speak the Irish language and many of the harp players and musicians only spoke Irish. So Patrick Lynch traveled to collect the lyrics of songs and all that type of thing, which Bunting was kind of, well, Bunting was collecting the tunes and Patrick Lynch was collecting the matching lyrics. Now the idea originally was to kind of join them up in a publication, but the two men actually had a falling out probably for political reasons and that never happened. But both the notebooks of Patrick Lynch and also Bunting's materials are housed in Queen's University in the special collections there. You can actually find some of those there on, um, you can see them online if you go to the Special Collections website. Now, anyway, I'm backtracking a little bit. So the first collection that Bunting published was in 1796 or possibly 97. And then that was followed in 1809 with another volume. And then the final and the largest volume was published in 1840. And one thing that sometimes people don't realise is the published materials, that only makes up a small fraction of the entire collection that Edward Bunting made, which the rest still exists just in manuscript form at Queen's University. Now, I'll show you the collection here. This is a modern version of the three collections compiled into one. You can see all my little stickies here. They're all my favourite tunes in the collection. And if you have a look through, you can see in his first volume, some of the first volume and then you go through they get progressively more complicated until you get out to the final one and you can see it's quite elaborate and what's also important is you might notice when you probably can't at that distance but um the three volumes are arranged for piano so bunting wasn't trying to publish what the harpers played exactly he was taking the melodies and arranging them to be performed on the piano now Apart from the, the impact for us, his collections also had a big influence at the time because Thomas Moore, the very well-known Irish poet, and he also played the harp actually, um, used melodies from Bunting's collections for a lot of his songs. And in fact, there was quite a bit of rivalry between the two men as well at the time. But, so that was kind of the short term, the, the collections had a, an impact on that. But for us, when we want to use them now, we can take tunes from those collections and reinterpret them to perform on our harps today. So the next thing I'll do is talk in more detail about how we can do that and some of the sort of pitfalls that you have to watch out for with the collection. So I'm going to talk now about how we can make use of the tunes in Bunting's collection to add to our own repertoire nowadays. The first thing that's really important to say is I'm focusing on the actual melodies, the actual tunes, but the collections also have a lot of information on how the early Irish harp was strung, how it was tuned, how, um, what type of ornamentation the harp is played, the types of basses they used, and also there's a lot of information about the harpers themselves. So it's not just the tunes, there's a lot of other information besides in the collections. And for people who are playing the early Irish harp, which is um, there's a, a fantastic revival of the early Irish harp nowadays. The collections and also the manuscript sources are a great um, kind of a trove of information for them on all aspects of the harp tradition. But what I'm going to focus on, as I said, is the actual music itself. Now, what we need to be aware of, well, there's a few things, but the first the key point that kind of is underlying everything is, well, two things, I suppose. First, the fact that the harp tradition was an oral tradition. So if you think of Irish traditional music nowadays, harp players or any, any instrument, 
they wouldn't necessarily play the tune the same way every time they would play it. So you have to remember that what Bunting was writing down was kind of like a snapshot. He was writing a specific version of a tune played by that performer on that particular day. And even if the same person played the same tune the next day, it could be different. And of course, there could be the odd little mistake in there as well. You know, we all might make the odd mistake under pressure. So you never know. Um, so it's not that the, the Bunting collection, that these are like the authentic version. It's a particular version of the tune as collected by him. Um, the other things that you have to watch out for, as I mentioned, Bunting was coming from a classical music background. So this kind of would have influenced how he wrote down the music. Of course, he had to write it down using conventional notation. But if you're familiar with slow airs or Shanno singing in the Irish tradition, you'd know that it's nearly impossible or very difficult to constrict the tunes like to kind of fit them into normal bar lines and normal time signature. Some of the tunes are very free rhythmically. And so you might find a tune in the collection that if you could just look at it, you might think, oh, it kind of almost sounds like a waltz because it's in three, four, but it doesn't mean it would have been played like that. It could have been played in a much more kind of free, free style kind of fashion. So that's one thing about the rhythm. The other thing is we know that the harps didn't have levers, so they were only playing in a set number of keys. But in Bunting's collection, you'll find tunes in four flats and three sharps and all kinds of different keys. Of course, he couldn't prop or he felt he probably couldn't put out a collection um, for piano just playing in a limited number of keys. So you don't have to um, necessarily play the tunes in the same key as what, what he has them, as what they appear in the collection, I suppose you could say. Now, the other thing is in terms of the tonality, Irish traditional music is modal. So we have two minor modes in the tradition. One of them is and the other is so one has a flattened sixth, one has a sharpened sixth, but both of them have the flattened seventh. So we don't use this scale. because we don't have the sharpened seventh in those minor keys, we don't use that. If it's a flattened seventh, probably keep it in, because that is definitely part of the tradition. So it's just kind of a general rule, but it kind of, it works most of the time. So flattened seventh, keep it, sharpened seventh, leave it out. Now, Bunting tended to add the sharpened sevenths more in the later collections. In the first collection, the 1796 collection, you can pretty much play the arrangements on the harp and they sound okay. I'm going to play one now as an example, just so to give you an idea. This is a tune called Old Trua or Shan Trua, and I'm going to play it more or less exactly as he's written it down, and it seems to work fine on the harp. I'll just tell you, there's two changes I've made. One is where he has a triad, I'm just going to play an open fifth instead. And also there's one little section in the middle where he does a little, little run like this, which I didn't think was probably likely to have been done on the wire strung harp and didn't like the sound of it. So I left that bit out, but the rest is pretty much Bunting's arrangement. So this is Old Trua from the 1796 volume of Bunting's collection. to what would have been played by the Harpers. In Bunting's 1809 volume, he 
he was kind of, I suppose, responding to Thomas Moore, who I had mentioned, the songwriter and poet. He had used a lot of the tunes from Bunting's collection to set songs to, and his Moore's melodies were so popular um, that Bunting kind of wanted to, I suppose, respond to that. And so in the 1809 collection, he set a number of poems or songs by various different poets to some of the melodies, but it just didn't work as well for him. And it didn't really have the same financial impact either. Like Thomas Moore's, like he sold so many copies of his melodies, but Bunting didn't really have that kind of financial success. But you'll find much more kind of elaborate accompaniments in the 1809 volume. And then the 1840 volume is the most complex of all. Um, very much piano style basses. You wouldn't do them on the harp. I certainly wouldn't um, in, in that style. And certainly on a wire strung or an early Irish harp, they wouldn't have been possible even. Um, so, or if, if you managed to do them, they wouldn't have sounded great. So the I'll play a little tune from the 1840 volume just so that you can see. Um, this is not Bunting's version now, but I'll just explain a few of the things I've changed. In this tune, it's the same um, key as the last one I played, but in this one, he's adding in the sharpened seventh that I was talking about. So he's changed the melody to... Which I wouldn't, I'm just leaving out those two sharps and I'm just playing it with... collections or what you can do about the keys and so on um, so basically I suppose to summarize if you're taking the tunes or what I do anyway when I take the melodies don't be afraid to make your own of them like I know for certain that these tunes would not sound the same on the early Irish harp and they wouldn't be interpreted the same way but I'm actually not really trying to replicate how the harpers might have actually played them in Bunting's time I'm trying to bring the tune to life for this harp that I'm playing and play them in a way that suits this instrument. So, you know, obviously if you play the early Irish harp, you'll interpret them in a way that will suit your instrument. So I'm just kind of trying to use the melodies and then arrange them as I feel, you know, suits the instrument nowadays. But it's really important to be aware of what might have happened at the time as well. So that if you're adding in other harmonies that you know, okay, well, they probably wouldn't have done that, but I like the sound of it. So, you know, and that's, that's fine as well. So for the final part of this workshop, we're going to learn one of the tunes from the Bunting Collection. I was trying to decide which one to teach because actually there are so many beautiful tunes there, um, some harp tunes and some from other musicians. In fact, the tune that I played for the Harps for Hope video um, that I did with my husband, William Jackson, was also from the Bunting Collection collected from a piper, I think, um, in Westport, close to here. But the tune that I've picked is a harp tune called Celia Canellan, and this was composed by Thomas Canellan. Now, Thomas was one of two brothers from Clunamahan in County Sligo, and um, we all know about Turlough O'Carolan, but there were many other harpers and composers also in the 17th and 18th century. And these two brothers composed a number of tunes, including this one. So the Irish title is Sheila Fiogni Conalon, um, if you'd like to find out more about the Canellan brothers, um, Kathleen Nottenham from Galway has done uh, a lot of research on their life and their music, and she's um, recorded all of their compositions and published a book of arrangements of them also. Or if you'd like to hear this played on the early Irish harp in maybe something like what Bunting would have heard, Siobhan Armstrong plays this on early Irish harp, 
And in fact, I've heard her perform it with a fantastic Shanlo singer, Roshnel Safdi, as well. So it's really beautiful to hear it being sung. A lot of these old harp melodies also had lyrics, but it's rare enough to hear them sung nowadays. So um, there are two versions you might like to check out. So Celia Canellan, Bunting collected this from Charles Byrne, who was a harp player from Leitrim at the Belfast Harp Festival in 1792, but it wasn't published until his 1840 volume of Ancient Music of Ireland. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm just taking the melody and then uh, arranging it in a sort of modern style. So I'm not trying to arrange it as Bunting might have heard it, but you're free to do that. You can do whatever you like. You can take the melody and certainly make your own arrangement and that would be fantastic to do. So I play through it first. It's in D minor, so we need B flats. Basically your levers should be in the key of F. And I'll just play through it first. The first time round is kind of a simpler version and then the second time I add in a few more chords and so on. So Celia Canellan. <laughs> tune into your head. Um, I do also have this available in sheet music as well if you want to get that afterwards so that you'll be able to you know go back and learn it at your leisure but um, I'll play through the melody now and again don't be afraid to stop and start the video so that you can kind of absorb what's going on so just play the right hand once. from four. 
more down from G when you go down and then back up the same notes. Cross under with your second or third onto the A. And then place four down from F. in his collection. 
section where he talks about the left hand the harpers used was that they usually played the chords rolled downwards. So it can be nice, it's tricky, but it's nice. So you could have... enjoyed that and if you get stuck you can um, search for the sheet music as well as I mentioned. In Bunting's notation of that he did add in a few accidentals as well in the left hand, a few of the like C sharps which I just discarded um, but the rest of the melody was basically the same. So I hope you've learned a little bit about Edward Bunting. Um, there's so much more to say but we only have a certain amount of time so um, I would definitely say check out the Queen's University Belfast special collections where you can find a lot of the manuscript collections online and also the collections you can see facsimile versions of that and it's just well worth it. don't be afraid to delve into it there's so many beautiful tunes in there so I hope you'll enjoy exploring it and finding some tunes yourself that you can um, enjoy on the harp. So thanks very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the workshops in this series as well.